From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, I am Estefania Bravo, and this is From the South. Peru has sworn in its new president, Martin Vizcarra. The country's former first vice president was suddenly up for office after Pedro Pablo Kuczynski resigned on Wednesday. Vizcarra took the oath in Congress and then announced the formation of a new cabinet, saying that his government would fight corruption while calling for a more functional government. Justice should be carried out independently with responsibility and efficiency. But at the same time, what has happened marks the end point of a policy of hatred and confrontation, which has done nothing other than cause harm to the country. The political class, and especially those of us who hold public office, we are obliged to give answers to the many needs, demands, and aspirations of every Peruvian. The soaring in comes after three days of political turmoil in Peru. Pedro Pablo Kuczynski announced his resignation after videos were published which apparently showed his allies trying to bribe members of Congress to vote against his impeachment. On Thursday night, thousands of Peruvians took to the streets to demand elections and the removal of all corrupt politicians. Social movements marched with the slogan, out with them all. For the protesters, Kuczynski's resignation is not nearly enough because most of the political parties represented in Congress are involved in corruption or other types of crime. It's been proven that all of them are corrupt. They are all part of the mafia. A politician has to think about the country, but these people only care about stealing. We demand elections. We want to get rid of this entire political system that has left us destitute. For the protesters, the current social and political crisis stems directly from the 1993 constitution enacted by Alberto Fujimori. This is why they are also calling for a constituent assembly. Our constitution is seriously lacking. We need to move away from neoliberalism, which has left us in misery. It's a constitution that works against the people, the land, the nation, and our natural resources. Whatever the final fate of Pedro Pablo Kuczynski, Many Peruvians want a fundamental reform of their country's political system. Venezuelan President Nicolás Maduro has unveiled significant monetary reforms. He is redenominating the Bolívar by knocking three zeros off the currency. The new monetary reform will become effective on June 4th. President Nicolás Maduro said this measure intends to protect Venezuela against currency speculators and especially from the economic sanctions imposed by the United States. On June 4, a Monday, a new currency system, a new vision and currency system. It's all ready. A currency redenomination, three zeros less. A new currency system to defend the Bolivar, and it will now be called the Strong Bolivar. I call for the defense of the Bolivar for all Venezuelans. There are those who want to have the U.S. dollar in the Republic. No Venezuelan will not be a U.S. colony. We will defend the Bolivar. We will defend the Petro. We will defend our monetary survival and the economy of the motherland. Under their reforms, a 1,000 Bolivar note will now be worth one Bolivar. Venezuela will have two new coins, half Bolivar and one Bolivar. It will also have new notes that range from two to 500 Bolivars. Currently, the largest note is 100,000 Bolivars. Maduro also announced Friday that people can begin purchasing the Petro through its website. In a tweet, he said the Petro wallet is a digital wallet ready to download. Citizens and companies will now be allowed to use the country's cryptocurrency to purchase real estate and pay taxes. Venezuela has congratulated Antigua and Barbuda on its elections, which took place on Wednesday. The Foreign Minister Jorge Arreaza tweeted a statement in which President Nicolás Maduro applauded the people of Antigua and Barbuda for holding successful elections and celebrated the re-election of the Labour leader Gaston Brown as Prime Minister. It said his friendship with Venezuela has brought the countries closer. On the streets of Antigua and Bermuda, optimism is high that Prime Minister Gaston Brown and the Labour Party will be able to deliver. Telesur Sayuna Gray reports from the capital of St. John's. After the results were released, North Street was awash in red 
as supporters of the Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party began celebrations that lasted well into the morning. And as a gift to his supporters, the Prime Minister-elect gave the nation a day off to celebrate his win. But for some people, work must continue. I've been here for a few months and it's going good. I don't really have a problem, you know, doing business here, being self-employed is one of the best things I think I've ever done in my whole life. Tourism is the main economic driver here. And while hurricanes pose a direct threat to the industry, Antigua has seen a rise in cruise traffic because neighboring ports are still recovering from hurricane season 2017. The government needs to step in and do something. It's like, I would say some of them don't know, some of them would know, but it needs a uh, 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 collaborative effort for everybody who is at stake. Prime Minister Gaston Brown placed his hand on the Bible and took the oaths of a legion, office and security. So for the next five years, Gaston Brown and his Antigua Labour Party will be responsible for steering Antigua's economic and environmental development. So, reporting here in St. John's, Antigua, this is Sweeney Gray for Telesio. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting. Welcome back. The family of murder Brazilian councilwoman Maria Franco has won an injunction in the Brazilian courts to have several defamatory videos about her taken offline. Google says they will comply with the order. 16 videos will be removed. Some videos claim Franco has ties to the, the Red Command, Rio's largest gang. Others claim Franco got pregnant when she was 16 and regularly smoked marijuana. The court order said it was a violation of her honor and image. Bolivia has been celebrating the Day of the Sea. President Evo Morales took part in events in La Paz while his legal team are pushing for access to the sea in the International Court of Justice in The Hague. La causa que Bolivia ha planteado ante la Corte. The case that Bolivia has submitted to the International Court of Justice is a simple case, a just case. We have gone to the court to ask them to mandate that Chile and Bolivia resolve their pending issues through dialogue and effective negotiations in good faith. This is the spirit that should be present among the nations of the world to peacefully resolve their differences. Chile has finished presenting its arguments in The Hague on the maritime dispute filed by Bolivia. On Thursday, during the first session, Chile said they were not willing to negotiate the 1904 treaty. Chilean lawyers will continue to argue that they have no obligation to negotiate with Bolivia according to their interpretation of international law. 
Our correspondent in La Paz, Freddy Morales, has been following the issue closely and sends us this report. El presidente Evo Morales reiteró su invitación a las autoridades de Chile. President Evo Morales has invited Chilean authorities to restart talks about access to sea. Morales led the events for the day of the sea today. The country remembered the Bolivians who, on March 23, 1879, resisted the Chilean invasion of land that connected Bolivia to the sea. Chile took 120,000 kilometers squared of land, of which more than 400 square kilometers was coastal land. The president reminded people that the legal process against Chile started seven years ago at the International Justice Tribunal of The Hague. The trial is in its final stage. This started this week and will end next Wednesday. Morales repeated that he will accept the decision taken by the tribunal. Chile, on the other hand, said it won't accept this result if it doesn't benefit them. Bolivia and Chile have broken off diplomatic relations since 1978 precisely because of this conflict. Cuyas autoridades adelantaron que no acatarán el fallo si no les es favorable. Thank you, Freddy, for that report. Hundreds of people have taken to the streets in Mexico City to protest against the disappearance of several students in the state of Jalisco. The governor of Jalisco tweeted that one student, Carolina Gonzalez, had been found alive and that the authorities would explain the circumstances shortly. He said they continue to search for four others. China's Hainan Airlines has started direct flights from Beijing to Mexico City, making it the first non-stop connection between the two capital cities. The service was designed to meet increasing demand from tourists and business people. Annual traffic between China and Mexico is 200,000 passengers at the moment, with Mexico being one of the top destinations among Latin American countries. An art exhibition by young prisoners has opened in Guatemala with the aim of enabling young offenders to leave their violent past behind. 80 paintings are on show in the cultural center Miguel Ángel Asturias, the main cultural institution in the country. It's the first exhibition of art by young prisoners. This pilot program is looking to reintegrate them to society. The project is being implemented in four prison centers. The first objective is for the young people to express their emotions through art, and the second one is to identify who has artistic talent. The young people relive their past in the paintings, and in some cases, rebuild the vulnerable situations that led them to commit crimes. We see their tormented past and their wounds, but these wounds are being cured, which is very important. So we see that these young people are on their way to reintegration. According to the Human Rights Ombudsman, the young people who have committed crimes, in most cases, grew up without a family, without access to education or any normal development. These paintings invite us to think about our society. Each one of the artworks that we see here has a different message. A lot of them are related to the theme of freedom, and this is without a doubt a call to Guatemalan society to keep believing in the reintegration of the youth. This project is promoted by the Social Welfare Department as a part of a new policy following prison riots last year, as well as the tragedy in the home Virgen de la Asunción that revealed the state's failure to protect minors in vulnerable situations. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting.
Welcome back. Social and environmental movements celebrated World Water Day with a protest in front of Coca-Cola's headquarters in Samambaya, Brazil. Demonstrators are protesting against the privatization of the Guarani aquifer, which su supplies water used to produce the famous drink. 35 million Brazilians do not have direct access to water, while another 60 million cannot count on clean water. Massive protests have erupted in Barcelona for following a ruling by Spain's Supreme Court to detain without bail another five Catalan leaders. Demonstrators are attempting to reach the Spanish government headquarters. Leaders will be tried for charges including rebellion, disobeying the state and embezzlement. In all, 25 Catalan separatist leaders have now been charged. The latest threats of imprisonment led to large scuffles between police and protesters. Thousands of young people across the United States will protest on Saturday, calling for stricter gun laws. The biggest march will be on Washington, D.C. Our correspondent, Francisca Emanuel, sends us this report. From coast to coast, hundreds of thousands of teenagers will be joined by their parents, teachers, activists, some politicians, and even celebrities this Saturday to advocate for gun control policies. This will be a nationwide demonstration, but here, Washington, D.C., is the epicenter. The March for Our Lives is organized by the students, survivors of the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Florida, where 17 people were killed by a former student, Nicholas Cruz, more than a month ago. The event has already a website and an app that will provide up-to-date information. And even though it's called March for Our Lives, here in D.C. organizers said that there will be no march because of the large number of people expected to attend, around half a million. The rally will begin at noon with performances and speeches from survivors of gun violence, activists and artists like Ariana Grande and Jennifer o Hudson will be here too. The DC rally is only one of more than 800 demonstrations planned by students around the world demanding a strict firearms regulations. Thank you, Francesca. Strong reactions have followed President Donald Trump's nomination of John Bolton for National Security Advisor on Thursday. Given Bolto's position on Palestine, it is expected that the conflict between Israel and Palestine will be further aggravated as he is opposed to a two-state solution and, like Trump, has taken an aggressive position on Iran. With more, we go to our correspondent in Caracas, Freddie Gillingham. Well, I think it's safe to say that the U.S. is soon to be newly appointed uh, National Security Advisor John Bolton is certainly not good news for Venezuela. This was best exemplified in several tweets made by uh, Venezuela's regime change fanboy uh, Marco Rubio who responded by saying that the last eight days have not been good for Venezuela's Maduro. That was in response to the news that uh, Bolton will be made the new national security advisor. Now who is Bolton? Um, well he's probably one of the most uh, militaristic new appointees within that Trump administration. He's long harbored a view that Venezuela uh, but also Cuba and Nicaragua have undermined U.S. interest in the region. He's been a rabid uh, supporter of the Iraq war. He continues to hold that stance. That best shows his um, feeling towards humanitarian diplomacy. Um, he's also been a big advocate um, of hardline attitudes towards North Korea, but also particularly Iran. He has even uh, come out with saying that the U.S. should openly bomb Iran uh, to cause regime change. Now, this is particularly concerning because not only Bolton, but the newly appointed U.S. Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, the former CIA director, they've both openly declared uh, and accused of Venezuela as, harbor uh, as of harboring Hezbollah, uh, the Iranian-backed Lebanese Shiite. Group. There's absolutely no evidence of this, but they believe that Iran and Hezbollah are in Venezuela. Now, this is very scary, seeing as they have openly called for bombing Iran. Um, it's going to be... Uh, we'll just have to wait and see how the Latin American community responds to this, as they're going to have to be particularly vigilant with these uh, two new figures uh, in Washington. Thank you, Freddie. 
There is growing unease in Britain at the government's immediate condemnation of Russia for the apparent poisoning of a Russian former spy, Sergei Skripal, and his daughter two weeks ago. Telesur's correspondent in London asked two of the most respected former correspondents about the lack of evidence and the similarities with the argument for war in Iraq. Well, I think the British response has been what one could call a rush to judgment. I mean, they haven't produced any evidence publicly as to why they think it was the Russian government that was behind all this. Uh, and in fact, within 24 hours, they said it was the Russian government before the scientists could possibly have analyzed this thing properly. So it fits into a general climate of Russophobia that's been created by the British government for over the last few years, starting with the uh, events in Ukraine in 2014 when the government was toppled in a coup which was supported by the British government, then the question of Crimea, and since then it's been a whole campaign against Russia and against President Putin in particular. Um, this is what happened with Tony Blair and the allegation that Iraq had chemical weapons, which was the whole pretext for the war, and which turned out actually to have been false. Um, the second um, consideration, which was really equal with that, was that when the chemical weapons charges were made against Iraq, there was almost no opposition in Parliament, in the House of Commons. Um, there was sort of a frenzy had been whipped up against Iraq and Saddam Hussein. And there was almost complete unity between the Labour government at that time of Tony Blair and the Conservative opposition. A gunman who took hostages in the south of France has been shot dead by police in the city of Trip. Before being shot, the, he killed three people. The local authorities have said the attacker is believed to be of Moroccan origin. It is also believed he pledged alliance to the Islamic State group. France has been hit by several deadly attacks since 2015. Around 130 people were killed in multiple attacks across Paris in November 2015. Now let's have a look at some other stories making headlines around the world. Hundreds of anti-government protesters took to the streets of Manila, Philippines to express their outrage over human rights and political violations. Demonstrators carried crosses depicting the people's struggles under President Duterte. Since his election last year, he has repeatedly threatened to impose nationwide martial law to crack down on drug trafficking and corruption. When a dictatorship cracks down on those who dissent, on those who say what's wrong, on those who fight for freedom and democracy and human rights, then uh, we will end up with a regime that violates everyone's rights. Thousands of people have joined protests in Warsaw, Poland and other Polish cities against the latest attempts by the Conservative government to restrict access to abortion. The latest proposals would allow procedures in cases where the mother's life is at risk or the pregnancy resulted from a crime. An attempt to ban all abortions in 2016 sparked 1.5 cut to their salaries, the equivalent of almost a month's pay. The strike shut down the Human Rights Council and other meetings held at the UN European headquarters. And we've come to the end of this news brief. These and many other stories, you can find them on our website at telesurtv.net slash English. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I am Estefania Bravo. Thank you for watching.